So I'm Laura May Hoffer, and this is Canine Turbo Training's Ask the Trainer Canine Play talk. Um, so this webinar is designed to answer your questions specifically. And I have a little presentation that I'll go through. Um, I'm going to talk briefly on each slide and then open it up for any questions. Uh, you can ask questions by typing them into the chat box or by raising your hand, like I mentioned. Um, so this also, I want to give a special thanks to Abby New, who set up uh, with me, we worked on the original play lecture, which is about a three hour version of this talk. Um, I have pared that down to just a few little interesting points on play. Um, we are going to be talking more specifically on dog dog play. Hey, Misty, welcome. Um, you can ask questions at any time in the chat box or by raising your hand. I'm going to talk a little bit and then there will be time on each slide for questions. So we're going to be talking specifically about dog dog play. Um, that play is usually done in dyads, but we, which is a group of two dogs. Um, we'll sometimes see groups play together as well. Um, in this talk, I'm specifically really talking about two dogs playing together. Uh, but your questions, feel free to ask about any kind of play. We see dogs play on their own, um, interspecific play, where they play with another animal of a different species, such as us, a human, um, or perhaps your cat, or I've seen dogs play with chickens. Um, so there's all different kinds of play we might see, including object play. If you have any questions on those, I'm absolutely happy to talk about that as well. So first, we're going to talk about what is play. So here is a nice, long, detailed description. <laughs> play is repeated, incompletely functional behavior differing from more serious versions structurally, contextually, or ontogenetically, and initiated voluntarily when the animal is in a relaxed or low stress setting. So that's a lot <laughs> to describe the word play. Uh, but if we break it down, we can see play is repeated incompletely functional behavior. So what that really means is play is not real in a sense that those behaviors with the animal is acting out does not achieve the specific function that they might achieve in a different setting. So I often will think about predatory play in this scenario where the animal is hunting something, stalking, chasing, grabbing, shaking, dissecting, and eating is the typical sequence of behavior for the predatory sequence. Uh, in play, we might see elements of that, but we don't usually see consumption. So for example, if two dogs are chasing each other down, it does not usually end in killing and consumption if it's play. So we're looking at incompletely functional behavior. It also tends to be repeated. So they'll do the same behavior over and over again. Um, it varies structurally and contextually from a real behavior. So we might see mock battle style play where two animals are wrestling um, or jaw sparring where they're clashing their teeth together. But those dogs are not actively trying to cause harm to the other even if it looks kind of intense. So there we see it contextually different. They're not actually upset necessarily. And we'll talk a little bit more um, as we go forward to in the details of understanding when a dog might be upset and when they're not, especially during those more intense kinds of high contact play. Uh, it, this also varies ontogenetically. So ontogenetically means developmentally. So as an animal grows. For example, we see the most play in young animals. Um, you can think about children, human children will play a lot more than adult humans. Dogs are one of the species where we see play actually continue into adulthood. So that's one thing that kind of sets dogs aside a little bit um, from other species. Um, there are other species that will play into adulthood, but dogs in particular tend to hold that behavior. Now, in different breeds of dogs, we'll also see play initiated at different times, but we'll commonly see play start once the animal has started to develop the senses to do play. So for example, if you can't move around, you're probably not playing. So as soon as puppies are able to move, we start to see them wobbling towards each other and engaging in behaviors that look like play. 
Um, at that point, we don't even have the eyes open yet or the ears open. So that is not necessarily engaged in play. We see a lot of bumping kinds of behaviors. Once the eyes open, we'll start seeing more kinds of stalking behaviors. Um, but the play is going to vary based on the stage of development as well. Now, we also see play only occur when it is voluntary. So if an animal is in a situation where they're forced into play with another dog, that is not actually scientifically classified as play. So we'll talk about those kinds of scenarios as we go through and look at some of our red flag behaviors. Now we also need a relaxed and low stress setting. So we, we say that play only happens where you feel safe. And we see this as dogs start to settle into homes. Perhaps somebody has just got a new dog that they brought home. You might not see play in the first couple weeks. Until that animal feels safe, play tends not to come out. So any questions on this long definition of play or what play is? And we'll come back to this kind of definition throughout the talk as well, uh, as we're thinking about what play is and how we can recognize signs of play or signs that play might be becoming less playful, uh, more serious. But as kind of a big takeaway of this definition, we're really thinking about a behavior that is not real per se. It's, it's for fun. And it's happening voluntarily by both parties or anyone who's involved in that. And it's occurring at different times throughout the animal's life. So going forward, we're gonna talk about benefits of play. And there are a lot of benefits to individuals for play. Um, I wanna start this slide with just a little video um, of a dog playing. So get, here's Kippy. Get off. Playing with a ball. <laughs> And one of the ways we can identify this as play is she's jumping on it and repeating these kinds of behaviors. She's mouthing at it a bit. But as she does this, she's not actively killing the ball. <laughs> um, she's not holding the ball down in a way where it can't move again. She's pushing it around, repeatedly doing this behavior that's out of context. In fact, it looks like she's digging on it. I could watch that all day long. She's so cute. <laughs> so, get into our presentation again. Um, here we go. So, as we're thinking about play, we want to think about the benefits of play. Um, oh, excuse, that made the... Let's go back and we'll get our presentation mode up again. Um, just a sec. There we go. Okay, so benefits of play. For our adult dogs, we're going to see lots of different benefits, including stress reduction. Um, they learn how to inhibit their behaviors. So we'll see things like inhibiting aggression. Um, they're honing skills. So there in Kippy, we saw her honing her skills of digging at a ball, of pushing the ball around. Um, this is some, sort of like a project that she's working on, getting better and better at moving that ball around, kind of standing on top of it, perhaps honing her ability to balance even. Um, play between two individuals helps them maintain and build relationships. So this is a really good way for dogs to get to know each other and to start to become friends. Now it's also a form of social cohesion for a group. So within a group of individuals, play helps them keep that relationship going and stick together. And we'll also see play in courtship. So if you have two dogs, um, a male and a female, if some of them are maybe not altered, we sometimes will see play as an initiation of a courtship behavior. 
Now puppies, you see there's even more benefits here for them. So in puppies, play is a really important thing. And we see that the brain is going to be developing during play. So they are honing skills, but they're also learning these skills for the first time. So in play, there's different pathways in the brain that's forming. We see things like synapses being created. So the, the connections between different neurons in the brain, and I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail um, because I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not qualified to go into this in too much detail. Um, but some of the things we see are um, greater myelination of the neurons, which means the, the connections are going faster. So we're going to start to see the dogs being able to think a little bit quicker um, they're developing their prefrontal cortex of the brain, which has a lot to do with thinking and processing, all through interacting with the environment in play. They're also going to learn how to cooperate and communicate with another animal. So they're going to learn how to read what another dog is saying or a person is saying. Um, they learn how to have a back and forth. And we'll talk a little bit more as we go forward about how play is in part a commun is, is a part of conversation between two animals. Now in groups, they're also going to be learning social rules and social norms. So there are some kinds of play that a group of dogs will be comfortable with and allow, and there are other types of play where that group of dogs might not engage in that. Um, they also, there are some studies that show that the animal is preparing for unexpected. So in play, things happen like another dog jumps on top of you, or you might be pushing on a ball and kind of fall off of it. Um, there's all sorts of different scenarios that occur in play, and this is a safe environment for them to start experimenting with it. It's a safe space for them to learn how to respond to different things. And then we also see for puppies, the adults can pass on behaviors to them through play. So an adult dog can demonstrate different pieces of, say, that predatory sequence we talked about earlier, um, stalking, chasing, grabbing, shaking, um, dissecting, all of those different pieces can be practiced in play. Oh, hi, Jess, welcome. So what questions do you have about benefits of play for either puppies or adults? It's interesting because we see a lot of benefits for the young puppies. We see tons of play in puppies. Uh, but the adult dogs actually benefit a lot from play as well. Um, I mentioned that they tend to have projects that they're working on. Uh, so you'll, if you look at a, a video of dogs playing, you can pick apart which dog is working on what thing. So sometimes we'll have dogs who are practicing chasing. So you might see a dog predictably chasing the other dogs around. They're practicing that skill. But I've also seen dogs practicing running away. So they'll run up and kind of like do a play bow towards another dog and then they run off in another direction saying, chase me, chase me. Or you might see the dogs grab a toy and shove it in the other dog's face and then run away with it. They are practicing running away. <laughs> and so all of those little skills that they might need throughout life, play gives them an avenue to practice and get better at those. All right, so what does healthy play look like? So when we're looking at play between two dogs, we wanna see really loose body language. So the muscles should be relaxed. And you can see in this photo, here's Kira. I love this photo because Kira is our like white husky dog here um, with this pink harness on. She is so floppy in this play that you can see all these kind of like loose wrinkles on her face and her ears are flapping in different directions and her tail is in this nice arc as she's running. Um, her body is super loose. Uh, and you can see Coda here, our, our doodle, has these flopping ears and his body is a little bit curved. 
um, his muscles are relaxed even as they sprint forward together. So I absolutely love seeing these loose, relaxed bodies in play. Now, another thing we can see just a little bit in this photo are play faces. So you can see both dogs have wide open mouths. Um, their jaws are relaxed. Uh, their ears are flopping and in a relatively neutral position for each dog. And you can really see it on Kira's face. She's got these almond shaped eyes, um, sort of like a human's eyes. We call these sort of soft or friendly eyes where the pupils might be a little bit dilated, but they're not the whole eye. Um, and the eye is kind of in this relaxed shape because the muscles around it are not tense. When a dog gets really aroused or fearful or overexcited, their eyes will get big and wide and round. But here we still have this like almond shaped eye, a loose relaxed jaw. Um, when you have this kind of play face going, it usually looks kind of goofy. So Kira here looks kind of goofy, like she's smiling. Um, and we'll often also hear this like, um, which has actually been called laughter um, in certain studies. So this goofy, friendly face, we'll see more play faces in other photos in this um, little talk as well. But during play, we also see just brief physical contact. So the dogs will check in physically with each other and then move off and create space. That brief contact usually tells us that play is, is nice and relaxed. It's a very healthy play to have shorter contact, not full physical constantly in contact play. Um, and we also see pauses. So pauses in play are really important. And this is one of the things that I'm really looking for to make sure that play is going well and that the two dogs are relaxed and healthy, that they will occasionally take a moment and check in with each other. So they'll stop what they're doing. You might get like this moment where they're both kind of standing next to each other going, <laughs> I'm panting. Um, they check in to make sure the other individual is still enjoying what's happening. You might see them then uh, do another play bow, or we might get some mirrored behavior where both dogs bound off together. Um, so mirroring is when uh, one animal does the same physical behavior as another animal. Uh, there have been lots of studies on mirroring in animals. Humans will do mirroring. Um, so you might see somebody cross their arms and they're standing with their arms crossed and the person next to them starts standing with their arms crossed and you might catch yourself crossing your arms. Um, this is occurring because of specific neurons in the brain called mirror neurons. Um, they're associated with empathy. And we see this in dogs too. So you'll see two dogs playing and they start to mirror each other's play um, by either falling into step and bounding in the same way or we might see simultaneous play bows or simultaneous shake-offs. Uh, the dogs tend to start to pick up on the other behaviors that the other individual is doing. Another thing that we look for in play, but isn't necessary for healthy play, is role reversals. So usually in play, one dog will take the role of perhaps prey or predator, or they might take the role of being on top during play or rolling over for the other dog to be on top. And what we like to see in play is that the animals are switching roles a little bit. So one dog is chased and then they do the chasing next and it's kind of a fluid exchange of roles. But in studies, we've seen that role reversal is not necessary to continue healthy play. So some dogs who know each other well, especially, will just stick to one game. So one dog chases the other until they catch them and then they're on the ground together, one dog on top, maybe gnashing their teeth back and forth in what we call jaw sparring. Now, role reversals are pretty important when two dogs are first meeting for the first time. So when dogs are first starting to play together, they're getting to know each other. They're getting to learn each other's play style. And role reversals are a really polite way to get to know another individual. But if you see two dogs, one that's always taking the role of being on top during wrestling or chasing, um, 
that doesn't necessarily mean it's unhealthy. I mentioned mirroring. The last thing I wanted to mention was the self-handicapping behavior. So self-handicapping is a really nice indication that dogs are playing politely and that it's really healthy. So self-handicapping can be uh, flipping over onto your side or back so another dog can climb on top and wrestling. It is often seen during chase games where the dogs aren't going full out. Um, they might be racing around, but it's not the top speed. So here we'll see this nice behavior of um, allowing another dog to catch up or allowing another dog to get on top. Any questions about what healthy play looks like? So here we can see uh, another, a really good play face on uh, Finnegan here. He's the, the big mastiff. He's got this really big grin going on. Um, his ears are back here because he's right up in the other dog's face. I think that's Madison. Um, and so when they're right up in each other's faces, we'll sometimes see the ears go back, making their bodies just a little bit smaller. Um, but in this slide, I want to talk about play as a conversation. Uh, because as I mentioned, there's so much communication going on between dogs during play. And play doesn't start unless it's voluntary. So in order for play to work between two individuals, somebody needs to say, hey, do you want to play? And we see dogs soliciting play in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the most common ones is this bow. So here you see one dog has bowed to the other and the other returned the bow. The play bow pretty typically has the, the elbows bent and the rear end up in the air. Um, and I love this photo because it's just perfectly timed with both of them offering that beautiful play bow. Now, it doesn't have to be the same exact behavior that is reciprocated. So just because one dog bowed doesn't mean the other one has to bow in order for play to get started. But we'll often see an invitation such as bowing, uh, flirty behaviors like rubbing their side along them or putting their butt in the other dog's face. You might see them suddenly take off running, um, bringing a toy over to the other dog. We'll sometimes see barking um, as play initiation. And we'll talk a little bit about barking as play initiation. Um, but we see some sort of behavior from one individual requesting play. And the other will reciprocate in some way, taking the toy, running off in another direction, or starting to chase the dog that initiated it. Um, could be bowing back or giving a mirrored response. But if it is reciprocated, then play starts. As they're playing, we like to see those pauses and check-ins, taking a break to read the other dog's communication. As dogs are playing, they'll give lots of signals as to how they're feeling. So play bows and loose body language tells the other dog, yes, I want to keep going. But we'll also see things called cutoff signals in play. So if one dog does something the other dog's not a huge fan of or that they don't want in that moment, we'll see signs from that dog that they'd like the other dog to pause for a moment or um, give them a little more space or stop what they're doing. Now, this usually looks like either a, a head turn or we might see the dog lay down or turn their whole body away or walk away. Um, you might see something like a yawn or a tongue flick, which are stress signals um, saying, this is a lot for me. Uh, let's take a moment. Um, with these cutoff signals, they tell the other dog, I need a moment. So responding to that, the other dog should pause or give that other dog space. Now, this can just be a brief break in play. We often see one dog does a cough signal, the other takes a second, waits. The first dog might initiate a different kind of game, taking off running, and then they go off together to continue playing. Cutoff signals don't necessarily end play. What they do is slow it down a little bit. Another form of a cutoff signal is called a displacement behavior. So you might have a dog who's playing and all of a sudden they stop and they start sniffing in an area where there is no new smell. 
Um, I see this a lot in greetings as well. Oh, hello, I'm, I'm busy. I got to check the, the smells right over here on this table. Um, I think of it a lot like checking your text messages, even when you know you don't have any. Um, it diffuses social pressure. So when we see that they're playing and then all of a sudden they're sniffing and doing something else, that is another indicator to whomever they're playing with that they need just a moment um, to calm down or just a moment to not do that specific behavior. Now, in play, the dogs can easily disengage. So these cutoff signals are a really polite way to say, I need a moment, and they often do appear at the end of play. Both dogs just go off and sniff different things and then take part in a different activity. And then lastly, if play has ended, it doesn't restart until there is another invitation. So when two dogs are playing, they might be wrestling or chasing and one dog says, okay, I'm done. I'm gonna go off and sniff over here. And the other dog says, okay, that's great. I'm gonna go check in with my handler. Um, that play will have another invitation before it continues on. So what questions do you have about the conversation of play? This is a way that we've been thinking about play more and more as we start to read the communication. And if you're really curious about the different body language we see, uh, we do have a, a whole webinar on canine body language that helps kind of read the different signs in dogs. Uh, during play, we mostly do see these kind of loose, relaxed bodies, um, play faces, as well as these cutoff signals that say, hey, I don't really like what you just did, or I need just a moment. And the nice thing about this communication is it helps moderate the dog's arousal. So if we have play where we're not seeing the communication or the conversation going on here, oftentimes arousal will go up and up and up. And that's when we start to see things like fights break out, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. All right, we're going to talk now a little bit about <laughs> breakdowns in communication. So when that conversation is not going as planned, um, as well as red flag behaviors we might see in play. So if we bring two dogs together and they're playing and we start to see arousal going up. So this might look like the dogs are starting to intensify in volume or they're not taking breaks. So we don't see any pausing between the two dogs. Um, here you can see in this photo, this little puppy, their front feet are completely off the ground they're so amped up. Um, and I absolutely love this photo as I'm thinking about communication between two dogs because it's impossible to see what these dogs are saying to each other. Uh, one is so aroused, his eyes are really big. You can see just a tiny bit of the white showing. All of his teeth are showing as he jumps in the air with his mouth way wide open. And then Rufus over here has got a tongue lolling out and it, the communication is off between these two. Um, it's not clear who's saying what to each other. But arousal, arousal makes it harder to take a break. If you're really amped up and excited, it's hard to take a moment and breathe and check in. So we see impulse control go down. As the dogs get really amped up and excited, we start to see harder biting in play. Uh, we start to see lack of response to cutoff signals. Those dogs aren't gonna be checking in with their handlers as much. Um, you might hear really loud, high-pitched kind of growling, such as like, ah, 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 ah. Um, Growling itself is not bad in play. We will hear a lot of growling in play, but as the volume goes up in intensity, we're often seeing arousal has gone way up. With highly aroused dogs, you might see the fur on the back of their neck stand up or all the way down the spine. Uh, their pupils will dilate, so you get these big eyes. I think of them like big black holes. And like I said, with high arousal, we start to see them not responding to these cutoff signals. Now, high arousal is something that I want to moderate. So if I'm starting to see the dogs getting really amped, I typically will call them out and have them calm down a little bit before sending them back into play. 
Not responding to cutoff signals can happen for several reasons, not just high arousal. We'll often see young puppies not know what cutoff signals mean. So we're gonna talk a little bit in the next slide about how to teach them cutoff signals. But it doesn't come naturally. Just like in human babies, they have to learn our language. They aren't born with a full knowledge of whatever language we speak. Same thing for puppies. <laughs> puppies don't come just with a full understanding of either English or whatever human language is being spoken, nor adult dog body language. So in the beginning, when two dogs are starting to play or a puppy is playing for the first time, it can be very helpful to give them assistance in learning these cutoff signals. Otherwise, we can end up with individuals who push and push and push for play or think that the other dog is having a good time until that other dog feels the need to aggress because their cutoff signals are ignored. Now, another thing we really look out for are highly competitive games. So if two dogs are playing with one toy and we see a lot of grabbing it and running, um, or if two dogs are playing tug and they're staring into each other's eyes the whole time, or we have deep guttural growls, those individuals might actually be competing over that object. Now, we'll also see competition during wrestle kind of play. So one specific kind of highly competitive play is called mock battle play, where the two dogs go up in the air and bump chests. Um, we'll sometimes see it as like lion's pose kind of play. Uh, but uh, up on their back legs with their front legs in the air, bumping chest kind of play is a competitive form. Uh, I'll often describe it sort of like hockey, <laughs> where it's high impact, high competition, and fights often break out. Um, if I'm seeing that a lot of this competitive up on their hind legs play, I will interrupt the dogs and work on some cooperation building games before I have them back together for loose play. Now this is also sometimes referred to as ritualized aggression. Um, ritualized aggression is any signs of aggression we see that are not actually communicating um, intent to do harm. So a dog might be playing and doing that jaw sparring game, showing all their teeth and snatching teeth against each other. Um, this kind of ritualized aggression is actually meant to size each other up and determine who would win in a fight if they were having one. Um, ritualized aggression is also something we'll see if a dog is trying to get another dog to stop. So you might see a growl and snap kind of behavior to stop the other dog. They might not be actively trying to do harm, but aggression is starting to come out due to the high level of competition or one dog being put into a spot where they're actually uncomfortable. Now, another thing that can break down communication is like pinning or forced downs or standing over. So if one dog gets the other dog on their back or on their side and then holds them down, we're not gonna get a lot of communication between the two. So since dogs communicate primarily with their bodies, if their bodies are being restricted or restrained, it's going to be much harder for them to get across those signals. If you're being held down, it's hard to turn your body away and say, I don't really want this to keep going on. We see pinning forced downs and standing over most in younger puppies. So the studies have shown that by adulthood, about two years, most of this behavior is no longer occurring in a well-socialized individual. Um, my theory there is that this does not promote extended play. So if you're doing something and play ends, but you wanted play to keep going, whatever you were doing is actually going to be punished. It's less likely that you will show that behavior because it did not get you the consequence you wanted. If we see pinning or another dog forcing another dog down, I will call them out and have them practice some other behaviors before going back in together. Now, another kind of red flag that I'd look out for are repeated or hard bites. So biting is perfectly natural in play. It's very normal for dogs to play with their mouths. Um, they don't have hands, so they interact with the world with their mouths. 
two dogs playing, especially two puppies, might bite at each other's necks. They might bite at each other's faces. What we're really looking out for, though, are repeated bites or sustained bites. So if one dog is biting repeatedly at another dog's neck or face, that area can become sore. Or if we get what's called a bite hold, where they bite and then hang on to the other dog. Um, there's also a bite shake behavior where they bite and then flip their head back and forth. So if they bite and then shake, um, that behavior is actually part of the predatory sequence. It's called a kill bite. They might not actively be trying to kill their play partner. In fact, they usually are not. But it is more dangerous because it can cause damage. So for example, if a large dog does a bite shake to a small dog, they could accidentally injure or even kill their play partner. So if I see those kinds of bites, I'm going to interrupt the dog, have them do something else before I send them back into play. Now, another thing we might see are harder bites. So this goes kind of hand in hand with high arousal, but it can occur in a dog with lower arousal who hasn't learned how to inhibit their bite. So dogs who maybe never got to play with their litter mates when they were very young um, or didn't engage in social play um, at, at a young age. So I'm talking about between three and eight weeks of age, usually before that dog enters into a home. Um, they might not have control over how hard they bite. So if we see things like red marks or dogs coming away with blood, um, that individual who's not controlling their bite can be dangerous to other dogs. So that dog might only be able to play if, for example, they're wearing a muzzle um, or playing in different scenarios where they don't have direct contact with another dog. And then humping. So <laughs> humping is one that we see pretty often in play. Um, very rarely is it actually with sexual intent. Most of the humping we see in play is a form of stress signal. So humping is a natural behavior that dogs will do. It tends to come out of stress situations because it is something that makes them feel slightly less bad. Um, if they're feeling a little bit of social pressure or a little uncomfortable or stressed, a young dog might mount the other. Um, at that point, they tend to realize they're actually kind of good at this. And um, so they feel a little bit better in the moment and that behavior is reinforced and we may see it come out more frequently. If a dog is humping in play, I typically will call them out. Um, another dog might correct that behavior. So we'll often see if one dog starts humping another, they might turn and snap at them um, or try and move away. If I can, I want to help before the dog who's getting humped feels the need to snap. Because then they are feeling like they need to be aggressing to get this animal to stop. Humping is a situation where it's hard for the dogs to communicate with anything other than aggression because that dog is usually behind them. So in those scenarios, I will step into the play and encourage those dogs to take a break. Uh, what questions do you have on red flag behaviors? So one of my favorite questions that I often get on red flag behaviors is actually about that jaw sparring that we discussed. So jaw sparring, again, when two dogs are clashing teeth and moving their mouths back and forth. Um, this is a form of competitive play. Um, it's a form of ritualized aggression. But we'll see two different kinds of jaw sparring occur. So some dogs will jaw spar in a very relaxed manner. So they might both be laying down next to each other with loose, relaxed body language, heads flopping back and forth as they clash mouths. That kind of jaw sparring, I actually will allow to just continue because the dogs are performing a natural behavior, but their bodies are relaxed and they're checking in with each other. Now, another form of jaw sparring I see is high arousal jaw sparring. So the dogs might be up, they might be their mouths, kind of lips pulled back tight towards their ears or lips raised to show off their uh, big front canine teeth. Um, with their mouths slashing back and forth at a high speed. You can hear them actually click against each other typically, their teeth. That high arousal jaw sparring 
indicates to me that we have lower impulse control and competition in play. So I will typically call the two dogs out to take a break in that moment. Um, because we have competition and higher arousal, it is a little more likely that we're going to see a fight break out. Again, think hockey. All right, training. So what can we do? Um, I mentioned quite a few times calling the dog out. Now, what does that mean? In play, when two individuals, two dogs are playing together or two kids are playing together, um, I work very hard to keep a positive tone throughout it all, especially with the young puppies getting to know play. I want the dogs to know that they are good and that they can do no wrong in play. But I will start to teach them that certain behaviors cause a pause in play. So instead of saying ah, ah, or no, or stopping the play through some kind of aversive, the best technique we can use is actually a recall. So teaching the dog how to come to us first before free play, and then in free play using their name, and then I will typically use some sort of high pitch repeating note, such as or pop, 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 sounds that are attractive to dogs to encourage them towards me. Now, the reason I want everything to be really positive during play, really happy and upbeat without the corrections, is because dogs can actually think, like young children, that somebody else gets them in trouble. So if two dogs are playing, and let's say there's a lot of biting going on, um, one dog repeatedly biting at the other dog's neck, and that dog's turning their head, trying to move away, whoever's doing that biting, I will recall out. But if I use an aversive, if I say, ah, no, that dog, looking at the other dog right in front of them, can start to make the association, you get me in trouble. And so their relationship starts to break down a little bit. Instead, if we say, um, let's say the dog who's doing the biting's name is Sandy. Um, if I say, Sandy, come, that dog stops biting, runs over to me, I'll feed them a treat for coming over to me and then maybe ask them to perform a calm behavior, such as a sit or a down. Let them lower their arousal a little bit. Feed them rewards for doing that and say, okay, go play and send them back in. The dog can come in with a little lower arousal, which means they're gonna be a little better at inhibiting their bites, have a little more impulse control, be able to read the other dog a little better. I can do this without causing any sort of distress between the two individuals. Now, this recall though, I want to teach first outside of a play setting. So I typically start in a quiet environment. And I'm not gonna go through all the details of how to teach this, but I will show you how we use it in play. Um, so here is a little video uh, with my voice in it. <laughs> nice puppies of two puppies. Good job, Dee Dee. So we can call Dee Dee out. Very nice. Very good. Excellent. Well, you gonna go say hi to the puppy again? So we can call her out. Good. Okay, so you can see there, there's these two puppies. Um, Dee Dee is our black and white puppy. Uh, she was really excited about the play. And our other puppy was a little bit more nervous. So as they were oh, playing. Oops, very sorry. nice puppies. Okay, there we go. Um, as they were playing, we had Dee Dee call out of play whenever we saw signs that our little dachshund friend was a bit nervous. That way, the dachshund did not ever have to use any sort of aggression um, to stop this other puppy from playing or from uh, the behavior they were doing. So first, we taught Dee Dee how to recall in a calm setting. Then she practiced in environments around distractions. And finally, she was practicing with another dog. Now, in this, somebody asked a question, uh, which I responded after the play session. Um, if she's not lying on her back, do I need to call the other dog out? 
Um, so this comes down to our point way down here that's teaching cutoff signals in play. So when two dogs are playing, I want to make sure they're communicating with each other, but they might not inherently know how to do that if they haven't had a lot of social experiences when young or if they haven't played with a lot of different dogs. So I want to be able to help the dog to read that other individual, their play partner. To do this, I need to be able to read that other individual. So I'm going to be watching both dogs and looking for any signs of discomfort turning the head, turning the body, trying to repeatedly move away, any sort of signs of stress, yawning, um, tongue flicking, could see things like uh, aggression starting to come out, agonistic puckers where they show their teeth. Um, if we start to see those signs, I want to call the other dog out. So here in this case, our little dachshund friend was nervous, so she was flipping over really young puppy. She was rolling onto her side, exposing her belly. This was not self-handicapping, and we could tell because when she did it, she was staring directly at the other dog over the top of her. Her body was stiff, and she held one paw up. Her tail was tucked under a little bit and wagging just a tiny bit at the tip, um, which is a sign of appeasement, and she was flicking her tongue. So she was showing some classic signs to me of stress and fear. And whenever she showed any sign of fear, not just that flipping over, but even just turning her head or repeatedly moving away, we called Dee Dee out. And what you saw actually in the very beginning of that video was Dee Dee starting to pick up on this, starting to understand that when the other dog turns their head away from me or tries to move away from me, the best thing I can do is go check in with my handler. So in the very beginning of this video, Dee Dee started to show those signs. And you might have heard my voice go, oh, good girl, because I want to praise those moments when the dog starts to catch on. Anytime one of the dogs does a cutoff signal, if the other dog does not immediately respond by taking a break or moving away from them, I will encourage that dog out of play using their recall. I'll reward them for coming over to me. Again, if they're really excited, I might ask for some calm behavior before I send them back into play. But with this consistency, the dogs start to learn that the other dog turning their head is a cue to come running over to your handler. And so they start to jump the gun, not waiting for us to call them, but turning and moving away when they see those signals that's a perfect moment to reward them because that is a great choice. So when we see these good choices made, I'll go right over and give that dog a treat right at their mouth. Any behavior you want to see more of, we can reinforce. So if you're looking at two dogs playing and you're seeing, okay, there are some really good elements here, but I also see this one dog doesn't really understand when the other dog is saying, no, thank you. What I'll do is I might take a clicker or I might use a verbal marker to mark moments where the dog does a really nice behavior that I want to see more of, play promoting behaviors, really healthy behaviors, such as self-handicapping or pausing and checking in with the other dog. I'll mark those moments by saying yes or clicking and I'll feed the dog's treats right at their mouths. And if I'm seeing a behavior that I want to see less of, that dog starts to jump up onto the other dog's back, um, or we get a uh, forced down where they push the other dog down and hold them down. I'll call them out of play using my recall cue or an attention noise. The moment they come away from play, I'll reward them for that. Very good, good choice. We'll practice something calming. If the dog can be calm, they can go right back into play. I want them to learn that this doesn't end play, actually turning and moving out facilitates play continuing. Because the other dog's signals are being read, they're going to be more likely to want to continue play. If their signals are ignored, we tend to see frustration increase, uh, and we see that aggression start to come out. Now, before play can happen, though, we do need to make sure that the two dogs can even politely greet each other. <laughs> So you'll see here, polite greetings and the ability to disengage is on my list of training I want to do. 
And I want to do this before free play. So let's say we have two dogs that we're bringing together for the first time. For example, um, Chrissy mentioned volunteering at a shelter. Um, so interest in seeing those dogs playing. Shelter staff, when they start to introduce two dogs, start with an introduction, typically not just totally loose play. What we always think about is if we're uncertain, take a step back. So if I have two dogs meeting for the first time, um, for example, my dog who is fearful of other dogs, we've been working hard to get her more comfortable with other dogs. She had her first face-to-face -face dog greeting um, just about two weeks ago. We started on leash at a distance and rewarded for calm behaviors and just being around each other. We slowly brought the dogs together. And when they were relatively close, we said, okay, go say hi. They got to sniff each other for just a few seconds and then we recalled out. So this photo you see here, it's one of my favorite photos because you have one dog standing looking relatively relaxed but attentive and the other dog turning away with their owner who just called them and the leash is relaxed during this. So the dog is not getting physically dragged out of the interaction. Instead, they're choosing to turn away because the recall behavior is so strong. Um, my dog is actually pretty deaf, so my kissy noise recall cue does not work with her in a situation where she's not facing me. So for dogs who are deaf, I'm actually gonna use uh, a contact cue, a physical cue. So she gets a, a little tap on her shoulder and that means there's treats behind her. I taught her this outside of the dog-dog interaction. So we make sure the dog understands how to recall out. You can practice this on leash at a distance from another dog before going right up to them. Once the dogs are able to turn and come away from each other from a few feet away, then I allow again a few seconds of sniffing and then recall the two dogs out. They can have treats for moving away from each other. And then we could say, go say hi again and allow them to sniff for a little longer before recalling out. If both dogs are relaxed and happy with the interaction and they're able to turn away and disengage from each other, free play is an option. If those dogs are not able to disengage, if we have to physically remove them using the leash, or if they greet and there's a lot of tension, those two dogs are not ready to play together in a loose manner yet. It's very likely that we'll see negative interactions because one or the other does not know how to take a break or move away. So instead of doing loose play, we'll want to start training around each other, build up a relationship first at a distance before we're right next to each other or off leash. Some of the ways we do this are through treat circles where we just practice feed one dog a treat to their name, feed the other dog a treat to their name. Um, so those dogs are actually learning how to take turns together. Um, another thing on here is cooperation games. So you can teach two dogs to be more cooperative and less competitive through training games. Often how we do this is we'll have one dog perform a behavior and all the dogs get treats. Or we might have two dogs perform a behavior together. So simultaneously touching either side of my hand could earn both dogs treats. We teach them to work together for the reward. And now it could be play instead of treats. So we could have the dogs both perform a behavior or one perform a behavior, and then both dogs get balls thrown for them on opposite sides of the fence line. In any case, we're starting to build the relationship before we even get to loose play. Uh, what questions do you have on these training games? I should mention I have a, um, a little article I wrote a few months ago on teaching cutoff signals that I'll send to you all tomorrow probably. Um, I'm going to send this to everybody who signed up for the webinar.
That one also goes over the details of teaching a dog how to recall away from other dogs, because that is a tough skill and takes step-by-step -step training. But until we have that solid recall, um, if the dogs were to get into an uncomfortable situation where one dog is not responding to another dog's signals, um, we don't have an easy way to separate. So having that recall in place is my first step. Polite greetings is my next step. And then we would consider off-leash play. Now, if you're going and you're having two dogs meet and they are either tense at a distance or tense up close, Free play is not necessary for two dogs to socialize or for a dog to play. So here is a list of some alternatives to dog-dog play. Play is important for all individuals, but it doesn't have to be wrestle-tackle play with the same species. So playing with toys is a really good way to get dogs to be able to practice the different natural behaviors such as tugging or chasing or um, all of these different behaviors that a dog will do without them having to perform this on another dog per se. Puzzle toys are a great way to do this, especially for uh, busy households. So my dog plays with a lot of different puzzle toys. It's how she gets most of her meals. Uh, training games, so practicing tricks or training together is a really nice way to help the dogs practice natural behaviors or even build relationships with each other, aside from rough and tackle play or chase games. Um, I'm gonna skip to uh, parallel play or, or buddy walks, hiking and outdoor play. So you'll see in this photo, we have uh, two dogs and two handlers walking together in a field. Those two dogs are forming a relationship with each other on leash without loose play. I mentioned my dog is in the very beginning phases of getting to actually meet dogs. She is not actively doing loose play right now. Um, she actually went on buddy walks with another dog. So forming a relationship by sniffing and exploring the world together as opposed to just tackle play. Now nose work is another really good one. So you can have the dogs search for scents. Um, by putting different kinds of smells out in the yard or teaching them how to track down a smell. And then for more social interactions, we can have managed non-play time around other dogs. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll set up a barrier between the two dogs so that they can just relax together without any pressure that play could start. Um, for parallel play, I often have an exercise pen or a gate between them and the two dogs can play on either side of that gate with toys. Most of my puppy classes, I will start play this way if I have two dogs who are just meeting for the first time who do not show immediate compatibility. Just because two dogs are together does not mean they're destined to be best friends. So in a class setting, I am typically setting my puppies up into dyads. Two dogs, they greet each other. If they are relaxed and get along and both the, one dog asks for play and the other dog says, I'd love to play, then we might move on to free play if those dogs are able to recall out. But in the very beginning, we tend to do our parallel play, playing on either side of a gate while practicing our recalls away from each other, making sure that we don't have a lot of frustration by rewarding the dogs for interacting together and then coming away to play with a toy. And then enrichment. So enrichment is anything that allows the dog to practice natural behaviors. So tearing up cardboard boxes that have treats inside. Um, our puzzle toys are forms of enrichment. Running with us can be a form of enrichment or going on a bike ride with your dog. These can be really nice ways for dogs to be able to meet their need for play, for socialization, without doing off-leash, rough and tackle, or chase games with each other. All right, so presentation-wise, that is all I have for you today. Uh, so now there's tons of time. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, Chrissy, Misty, and is Jess still here? 
Um, thank you so much for attending this talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm going to hang around if you have any questions at all. So please let me know. And again, you can ask questions by typing them into the chat box. Uh, for some reason, I was not able to unmute when somebody raised their hand. So if you want to type anything you have into the chat box. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending. Um, oh, here we go. We have actually, there you go. You were just typing. Um, if two dogs are playing and a third is barking at them and specifically nips at one of the dogs, do you think he's wanting to join their play? Oh, this is a really good question. So if we have two dogs who are playing and a third dog is barking at them, we'll typically refer to that as satellite barking. So this is where the dog might be circling around them and barking at them. Um, ah, you added, or, or do they maybe want to break up the play? Um, typically when we see a satellite barker, they are somewhat uncomfortable with the play that is going on. So we sometimes see this if a dog is guarding one or more of those individuals. Um, we can see this if a dog is feeling anxious about the level of excitement or arousal going on there, um, or if they're just generally not super comfortable around the two other dogs. More often than not, they are not trying to join in the play. Um, they might be trying to divert one of the dogs away to play with them, especially because if they're specifically nipping at one of the dogs. Or it could be that their anxiety is more specific towards that individual. Usually when we see satellite barking, if we interrupt the play, so those two individuals who are playing, we interrupt that play and they relax, the satellite barker goes and lays down somewhere else. So more often than not, it's more about getting that play in front of them to end. Now, if I have a third dog going around, two dogs who are playing and barking or nipping at them, I will recall out that third dog and show them something else to do. It might be getting them out of the environment even um, because that kind of barking, especially if we're getting that like circling around and barking and then occasionally nipping, it actually is often associated with anxiety which is a form of fear. So the adrenaline can cause them to come in towards the play. Um, the barking, um, the nipping is all associated with arousal and adrenaline, um, but they tend to stay a few feet back because of fear. I'm, I'm a bit nervous about what's going on here. Um, I can't get right in the middle of it, but I would like it to stop. So we get that kind of barking behavior. Um, it kind of leads me to think about a couple other things too. We mentioned uh, dyadic play. So play tends to take place between two individuals, not three. Um, there is triadic play. So sometimes three dogs will play together, but usually that's when they all come together at the same time. Um, we rarely see two dogs playing and then a third dog joins in and it goes smoothly. Often if two dogs are playing and a third dog tries to join in, one of the two that are playing will either tell that dog to leave or might leave themselves. Um, okay, the barker also barks and nips at the same dog when he has a toy. Yeah, it could be something about the two dogs relationship then. So if we're seeing the, the barking and nipping in other contexts, it could be that that dog is uncomfortable when, when Dog, we'll call, okay, so dog number one is the one who was in the play and has the toy. Dog number two we'll call the, our satellite barker. Um, dog number two might be a little uncomfortable when dog number one has coveted resources. Um, so in this case, I would probably separate the dogs and I'd work on cooperation games. So our treat circles, um, cooperative training where we ask one dog to do a behavior and both get treats. And with my treat circles, I'd set it up so dog number one, who's doing the playing or has the toy, um, gets the treat first. And then dog number two, the one who's doing the barking and nipping, gets the treat second. That doesn't have to do with anything like dominance or creating an alpha. What it has to do with what predicts what for the individuals. So I want dog number two, our barker, to realize that when dog number one gets something good, it predicts something good for him. So each time dog number one gets something good, something good happens for dog number two. And you can do this also with attention. Dog number one gets praise and petting, dog number two gets treats off to the side. 
I typically start with a gate in between them, especially if I've seen any level of resource guarding or other kinds of uh, tension between the two dogs. This barking and nipping behavior is enough for me to recommend a gate between them. Um, Ah, satellite barker is resident dog, whereas the other dog has adopted in. Yes, so it can be kind of insecurity starting to pop out. Um, we, our resident dogs often have a tough time when we have a new adopted dog because their life is changing. Essentially, they have a new roommate who they didn't ask for. So I try and set it up so that lots of good things happen for the resident dog when our new adopted dog gets attention or toys or treats. And if in doubt, I'll add in a piece of management, a gate between them, an exercise pen across the room so they can still be together, but we don't have as much physical interaction. Um, our resident dog might also just need a break here and there. So if it's specifically happening between these two, I think about how can I build up their relationship so that they feel like together they're able to earn good things. That's a really good question too, because we do see a lot of satellite barking happening when there are more than two dogs involved. Um, daycare settings or play groups will often see if one dog is uncomfortable, they might become a satellite barker. Uh, third dog is a long-term foster while during play runs between my legs. <laughs> do they run between your legs as play? Do they keep going afterwards or do they run between your legs and pause there? Because I've seen dogs who take shelter behind the human when things are getting a little intense. Yeah, pause there. It could be a cutoff signal that you're seeing. Um, so when I see, especially in younger dogs, they might go behind the human's legs or stand between the human's legs as a way to say, okay, I need you to kind of take a break from what you're doing, um, or I need this to calm down a little bit. By actually actively running to the human handler, they often will get more of a response from us. <laughs> so I've seen a lot of puppies, as soon as they run between their people's legs, their people are saying like, oh, back off to the other dogs. So there it can be reinforced by getting our attention and us helping them out. Whenever dogs are playing, I always want them to know that I'm there and I've got your back. And it sounds like your third foster dog definitely understands that. They're like, ooh, I'm in over my head. Let me run over to mom to get some help. Um, so that's a great sign for your relationship with the pup. Um, I'd make sure that if we see those cutoff signals, anything before that even, we're helping that pup out. Um, sending the other dogs off to another place or recalling them over. If I have a, a nervous dog in play, um, I want them to know that I can be there to help them and that they're absolutely safe and can run out to a safe space whenever they need. I mentioned that play should be voluntary and our space has a lot to do with being able to have play be voluntary. If we're in a like a tight closed area where there aren't actual ways to move out of the space, play will sometimes happen as a way to diffuse tension. So um, we actually have a video somewhere of two dogs playing inside a little gazebo. Um, so they're shut into this small play pen area and one of the dogs is just repeatedly jumping on the other one and chewing on them. And it's kind of play. Um, it's them using play behaviors to diffuse tension. And so here it sounds like your foster has found a safe space where they can have play pause by just going between your legs. So that is absolutely fine. I just also think about making sure that there are exits for them, ways to get out of the room, ways to, places they can go to take a break or pause play. I've actually been actively teaching my dog to go stand between my legs. Um, she's, she's like a hundred pound German shepherd, maybe mixed with something rescue. And so she's, it, it's really goofy when she goes between my legs. <laughs> um, she tends to go straight through though, right out and on the, on the way. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's a question. How to approach a dog who tends to play rough with other dogs? Assuming the dog does not know how to read cutoff signals well, but sounds like training should be first approach rather than allowing free play. Uh, mentioned muzzle possibly as being an option, but would you muzzle both dogs in the case or just the rough one? 
Uh, good question. So oftentimes I'll have both dogs wear muzzles if they're comfortable with it. Um, I don't want to put a dog in a situation where one is muzzled and a fight breaks out and they can't defend themselves. The muzzle is a tool I'd use if we have a risk of fights um, and otherwise the dogs are relaxed and able to come away and play. So it's, it's really a management tool I'll use if a dog has an does not have an inhibited bite, but otherwise reads social cues well and can recall away. Um, so for example, if a dog is able to go up and greet calmly, but when they get into the arousal and excitement of play, they bite and do damage, then a muzzle could be appropriate. It's one of those tools I don't use as a crutch. So if the dog is over aroused at the first greeting and they play real rough, I want to actually calm them down before they go and play free altogether. So instead of going to the muzzle option, I do things like buddy walks or parallel play. Um, the muzzle I'll typically only use if the two dogs are, are good friends, but one of them does not have an ability to inhibit their bites. And yeah, I love your point. Having both dog muzzles is a great option so that if say there were a disagreement we don't have one dog in a really tight spot um, the muzzle is never something i'll use where i think that it is the only thing preventing aggression um, this is for a dog who could not control their bite it's just one option to give them the ability to be around other dogs yeah absolutely i'm glad you found it informative this one is really hard because I have about three or four hours of information I love to present on play. And so trying to pare it down to give time for questions, but also not take up all of your time for the entire night has been very hard. Um, but if you ever have questions about play, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm gonna be sending an email um, probably tomorrow, I think I have time, um, with uh, the article on cutoff signals as well as there's a, a PDF that I really love that talks about like the three things to look out for in play. They break it down as like loose wiggly bodies, pauses and breaks, um, and responding to the other dog's signals. Um, and I'll see if I find anything else that is uh, nice, friendly uh, articles for reading about play. Um, you can see these references. Here's the more kind of scientific literature, a little bit more detailed. Some of these are books, but if you are really interested in play, I highly recommend looking into some of these sources. Um, the book, uh, Canine Play Behavior, The Science of Dogs at Play is a really nice one. Um, this one, I think I read in like two evenings after work or something. So it's a really accessible kind of fun book on play. Um, Let's see here. Um, animal play, evolutionary, comparative, and ecological perspectives is also another nice one. That one's a little bit more uh, scientific, so it's a little bit uh, denser, uh, but it's another really good read. So if you like to read books on play, there's two that I'd recommend. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, Again, this is one of my big passions. And if you do come up with any questions at all, feel free to reach out. I love talking about play. Um, I hope you both have a great night uh, and I hope to see you in other webinars as well.